Hello, and welcome to DW Fast Track, where lawyers discuss the hottest topics and trends in the legal industry. I'm today's host, Jennifer Coe Craft. I'm a member and partner at the law firm of Dickinson Wright. I specialize in the area of intellectual property, including trademarks and copyrights, as well as sports and entertainment law. In this episode, we'll be joined by my colleague, Kevin Everidge, to discuss how to best utilize outside counsel. Again, my name is Jennifer Kraft. Prior to joining Dickinson Wright, I was Associate General Counsel for Andre Agassi, the world-renowned tennis player, as well as Associate General Counsel for a talent management company, where I negotiated and drafted various contracts, including talent services agreements, endorsement agreements, and the like for actors, entertainers, professional athletes, and other celebrities, including Shaquille O'Neal, Elio Castroneves, and Michael Mina. I was also corporate counsel for Sunbelt Communications, where I handled all corporate and intellectual property matters for about a dozen NBC and Fox affiliates. Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Everidge. I'm an associate attorney at Dickinson Wright in its IP litigation practice group. My experience working in the legal industry started 15 years ago at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, where I was examining patent applications that were mostly related to surgical tools and procedures. After that, I enrolled in law school and started dipping my toes in in-house practice, where I worked as an intern for one of Jennifer's sports and entertainment industry clients. And while there, I expanded my knowledge and experience in intellectual property to include trademarks and copyright prosecution and enforcement. Then I interned for another in-house legal team for another one of Jennifer's clients. That one was in the data center industry. When I completed my time as an intern there, they hired me onto their in-house team. I registered as a patent agent and managed their patent portfolio, as well as the patents for a few independent inventors for my own small business. I was also learning and contributing to litigation matters and patent, trademark, and trade secret enforcement. I was doing those things while I attended law school and business school at night. Uh, When I eventually graduated and passed the bar exam, Jennifer reached out to me about joining Dickinson Wright. I've been with the firm for the past couple of years now, and a substantial amount of what I do involves litigation and IP enforcement for Jennifer's clients. Thanks for inviting me to talk to you today. One of the reasons why we are here discussing this topic is that Kevin and I actually had a long call discussing this very topic of how to best use outside counsel. Both Kevin and I are in a unique position in that we both started our careers in-house and are now in private practice. Most attorneys start the other way. They're in private practice and go in-house. But I think because of our backgrounds and because we started in-house, we have a very unique perspective on how we practice law and how we service our clients. We've obviously seen both sides of the relationship, both being the client as well as a service provider to the client. So I thought it would be interesting to discuss some of the things that we've noticed, both as being a client and a service provider that perhaps clients don't realize are tools, tips, suggestions, you know, best practices in terms of working with outside counsel. Being in-house, we know that there's a lot of pressure to keep your legal bills down, but yet there's that push and pull in terms of needing legal, you know, opinions that are outside of your field and how to best establish um, that relationship, but also benefit it from that relationship. So I'll just start off with one of the first tips or tricks. And for me, it's don't be shy to ask for off the clock time. So what I mean by that is, again, in-house counsel, they often feel the pressure to keep the bills down, but they still need the advice. And perhaps it's just one of those gut check questions. Maybe it's a question that we know that the attorney can answer very quickly, or maybe it's, you know, it might generate more work down the line, but I need a quick answer. And so I often will even suggest to a client, especially if they're maybe one attorney within a large company or there isn't an in-house counsel and they just need to get someone else that bounces an idea off of someone. And I love it that it's me (laughs) and I want them to freely come to me with these questions. And I don't want them to feel the pressure that every time they pick up the phone that I turn on the clock and bill them for every second. For me, it's about establishing a relationship and it's more about the long run for me. So I think Some clients don't know to ask, hey, can I ask you a question off the clock? And it's a great way, 
yeah, to one as a client, figure out if that's a no or a yes. Um, I mean, I, I assume they will say yes, but uh, once you have that kind of relationship, obviously, but also be respectful of their time too, because I've offered it and sometimes clients will take up, you know, maybe an hour or more of my time and that's fine because they might just have such a wide variety of, you know, questions or issues they're tackling. But I think so long as you're respectful with it, I'm happy to answer questions. I agree. I think that the stress of how much we charge is a real thing. It's something that's discussed a lot internally. It's something that they feel a lot of pressure about. And that's probably where that reluctance comes from to reach out and talk sometimes about things that may not seem like they're super critical, or maybe I can push this off and just discuss it later. But if you just reach out with a quick question and you're asking for a freebie on this side, now that I'm in private practice, I kind of enjoy that because I love what I do. And so it gives me a chance to just kind of show off my knowledge or jump into a fun, quick issue. And it does build that relationship that you discussed. And I think that if you can kind of establish with them, the client, that you're not just trying to nickel and dime them every time you send an email or hop on the phone, that they'll start to believe that you're a partner, not just a service provider and an expensive one at that. And so if you really are trying to create a long-term relationship, I think that's a really good way to establish a good rapport with your outside counsel. And when you're in-house, whether you have an in-house attorney or an in-house team, or if you don't have any in-house law guidance at all, the pressure of those bills and specifically the fact that they're so random, it can be a problem. You're running a business and you're trying to plan your budget. And then this small issue arises and now all of a sudden you've got this huge bill. And one thing that I've recognized being on the in-house side is that Typically, your arch nemesis is the CFO. That's the person who is always, always harping on you. Like, why did you spend this much money? What is, what is, what is this? That CFO, that's their job. They need to make sure that every dollar that the business is spending has a purpose, that there's a value add, and that if you're going to be using legal services, that it's necessary. And if you can go back to them and say, look, we're actually getting a lot from this relationship that I'm not sure that we'd be getting elsewhere, because these are all the things that they're not charging us for. And what I do from a law firm perspective as an outside counsel, I make sure to enter my time every time I speak with, with the client, even if it's an off the clock call, which I'm again, happy to do. I enter the time and describe it and then bill no charge it because I understand having been in your spot before, where I'm now reporting to somebody on the financial end of it, where I have to explain what value did I receive from the advice or from the relationship or from you know this interaction, I can show that yes, we spent X amount of dollars getting guidance, but look at the time that she spent not billing us. And that's really more about establishing the relationship. And just dovetailing on what you were saying before in terms of bills being sort of sporadic sometimes. And that's, it's hard because as outside counsel, we are reacting to questions and, and issues. And so they can ramp up and at times and slow down at others. But as a client, I don't think you should be shy to ask. I get the question often, you know, how much is it going to cost? That sort of thing. I think that's not a, that's not a new or different, you know, question to ask, but maybe be more specific you know, what is the overall budget for this project and what's the timeline? And can we work it so that the monthly budget looks like this? Because I only have this much in my monthly budget, but I have a project that I know is going to cost a lot. Can we break it out a bit, work it in stages? So it's, again, just really creating that good rapport with your outside counsel because we want to get paid too. And we understand that there's stress on your side, but we just need to know, okay, what are your constraints? You can only have this much in your legal budget a month. What can we do to pace out the project so that we're in that timeline and budget? And if we're not, can I hold my time? So I recently was asked that question where it was a brief that I knew was going to 
take quite some time to do. We flat feed it, but we knew it was going to be more than what their limited budget was. So we broke it out in two pieces and I was happy to do it, hold my time and do it in two pieces. Didn't matter to me one way or the other, but it helped her because she wasn't questioned on the bill because it still was within her monthly budget. What we're talking about now is really about getting to know your outside counsel better and establishing that good relationship. And just sort of that kind of eases me to the next topic was, you know, how do you establish that relationship with your attorney? Maybe it's somebody that you don't often work with, maybe sporadically, or maybe it's somebody you work with often and you have a long going relationship with them, but you may not have gotten that good sort of chemistry with, right? It's funny because when I was in house, you know, I realized I'm the client and therefore they must do what I asked them to do, right? But now as a attorney in my, in a private practice where I'm servicing clients, I have a very busy docket, constant flow of work. And I will tell you that a please and thank you go a long way. And I'm not saying that all clients are rude. They're not. I have actually, I'm really fortunate to have very courteous, very grateful clients. But I've noticed, at least for myself, that when a client says please and thank you, or patient, or understanding, or just more human in our interactions, I tend to put them higher in the stack. And the longer I've worked with them, the more I know what their pressures are, what their issues might be. I know when I can put them on the top of the stack, or maybe I ask them, hey, can I get it to you next week as opposed to tomorrow? Because I just know them so well. But it starts with that please and thank you. It's funny. I think in this area, it's so antagonistic in general by very nature of our practice, of our uh, profession, there's always some kind of he did an exchange often, even if it's with a client, because the client might be engaged in a lawsuit or receive a letter or whatnot that they have to respond to. So the emotions are high, but I find that just having common courtesy and recognizing that the person you're speaking with is a human and myself being a mom and a wife, I am not a robot. And so when people recognize that and appreciate that dynamic, I find that it goes a long way in terms of helping a client and servicing them appropriately. What do you think? I agree. And I think that a lot of that comes from misconceptions about what this job is, what lawyers do. I think a lot of that comes from movies and TV, and that's there to entertain. You see characters in, in entertainment. And so when certain people see that and have this expectation that every lawyer they deal with is just some vampire. They're coming after my money. They're just trying to bill me as much as possible. They're an adversary, just one that I need sometimes. A lot of times that's where that attitude comes from. And they figure, well, I'm gonna have to deal with lawyers from time to time. It doesn't really matter who it is. They're all the same way. They're all just trying to get as much money out of me as possible. And so that creates that attitude that you're talking about that sense of distrust. And I think that's where these bad attitudes come from, but it's not like that. It's like you said, we're, we're humans too. We're just doing our job and we're trying to do it well. We're trying to do it for you. We're trying to accomplish the goals that you're trying to accomplish. And you came to us for a reason. There doesn't have to be all this friction. We can be cordial at the least. Ideally be better than that. Well, you know, you, you raise an interesting point in that I do feel Perhaps when you're talking to a client who isn't an attorney, so say it's a company that has no in-house legal team and it's just business folks, I've found that at least with some of the newer clients, that they, they do feel that antagonistic sort of relationship with their outside counsel. And when I get that sense, I immediately change the tone or the um, direction of the conversation and let them know I'm here as a devil's advocate. I'm asking you these questions because I know the other side is going to ask you these questions. It's not because I'm challenging you on your authority or your answers, but I have to be prepared with what the other side is going to ask me. And so I try to give kind of more context to why I might be asking the questions 
or why we're having this line of conversation, because people do tend to view attorneys as being someone you're opposing. But for me, I'm all about knowing where the skeletons are in the closet <laughs> and figuring it all out and then being best prepared, right? So when I have a client that feels that way, I really, from the outset, try to figure out where it's coming from. And maybe it's just not a relationship that will develop into one where it's, you know, where we have a good rapport. And that's okay, too. I mean, I'm not for everyone. Kevin, you're not for everyone. And we don't have to have this close, you know, trusted advisor relationship with everyone, though that's my goal, obviously, with every client to be the trusted advisor. But it, sometimes you just don't get there. But I am always upfront when I get kind of that reaction from a client to try to get to the heart of it, to the root of it. And if it's because they feel the pressure of the billable hour, then we try to fix that, you know, or if it's because they've had some kind of experience before with an in-house attorney or a private attorney. For me, and I've said this many times, you know, working with a client, it is truly a relationship. It's a lot of give and take. I can't be the one who's always taking. I can't be the one who's always giving. And it's about figuring out what the client is like, what they don't like, and how to service them specifically. Because not every client is the same. Not every company is the same. Not every you know person is the same. And I really, I try to target my not only my advice, like the content of my advice, but how I deliver that advice too. So if I have a client who feels that pressure of the billable hour, and even though I tell them it's off the clock, or even if I tell them this or that, they still feel that sort of pressure or antagonistic sort of feeling, I keep it short. I recognize, okay, this person is operates in this way. They're much more clinical. They want an answer, yes or no, in and out. That's okay. If I recognize that as the type of client that person is, then that's how I service them. It's just harder with that kind of a relationship to get more from them, to know like, you know, what their timing looks like because they don't want any extra questions. <laughs> and usually it's because they're so busy, right? It's just harder to develop a rapport. But I found that those types of clients though over time warm up to me <laughs> or they don't, but usually they do. And that's when you can really better feel of their daily pressures and what their uh, needs are. The next sort of topic is then, you know, we talked about common courtesy, some professionalism when interacting with outside counsel, which goes both ways, because I think outside counsel also could heed the, the same advice with the please and thank you. But how do you establish that rapport? And I think that a lot of clients, at least for me when I was a client, I didn't like being pitched, like for more work or for other things. It just made it kind of uncomfortable for me. So I never really asked our outside counsel to lunch, but I think clients should because it's a perfect time and opportunity to get an hour or so of their time, not build, where you can ask questions. And again, don't take advantage, but usually that hour is, you know, business development hour for them, but it's an opportunity for you to get to know them better. Maybe they have areas of expertise you didn't know about. And for likewise, for them to get to know you better and to know your business and your industry and what pressures you might be facing. So feel free, ask your, if there are um, areas in your job that require you to have a better knowledge of a specific legal issue or concept, you should ask your attorney out to lunch. Say, hey, can I pick your brain for an hour? Would love to get to know you a little bit better. There's a recurring issue that comes up and it would be great just to, to talk with you for a little bit for, you know, and have lunch. I don't know how many times a client asks me to lunch. It's not often, it's usually me asking them to lunch, but when they do ask me, I love it because that means they do want to deepen that relationship and get to know each other better. Or it might be that I do have a really great relationship and we you know, are truly just trying to get together. But taking advantage of that lunch where they're not billing you, I don't think people, clients recognize what an asset or a value that can be to them. I don't even know if they're, most of them are aware that it exists. It's the, it's the ultimate freebie, right? Right. We were just talking about quick questions on an email or in a short phone call, but this is face-to-face. -face. You're together for an extended amount of time. Long-form questions, long-form answers, 
building rapport, getting into all of the issues that are going on for the company, which is valuable for us, which is valuable for you. We get to get to see the big picture, which helps us a lot when we're trying to solve smaller issues. That's a great point. I don't know how many times I've had lunch with a client and they drop something like, oh, and by the way, dot, 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 we have plans to open something or they just finished a conversation with our CEO and he mentioned that we're expanding here or we're doing this or we're doing that. And that context is so beneficial for your outside counsel because it frames the advice that I give you. Oh, I know that they're in a growth mode. Oh, I know that they're wanting to enter a territory in which they don't have trademark applications, for instance. Or, you know, it's just good to have that context when I'm giving advice. That context is huge. It's it's the why. Like we're we're often dealing with just the what. Exactly. We're, we need you to do this. That's the what. But understanding the why and not just understanding why you're doing things, but also getting from the client what in your mind is the best possible outcome because for pretty much any issue there's a variety of outcomes and there are a handful of those that are acceptable but we want to know which one do you want the most right because clients come in all different shapes and forms right some are super risk adverse some are (laughs) risk friendly somewhere and you but most of them are somewhere in the middle right and to figure out kind of where they're risk tolerance lies is huge because how I would present a recommendation. So I, I always give options, but I lead with a recommendation. And if I know this client, you know, is okay with taking a little bit more risk, then my recommendation might be different than someone who I know is very risk averse, but without any context, it's hard to give that kind of advice or have that advice be pinpointed. Yeah. I agree. (laughs) And just having that conversation over lunch where you can not just talk about the what's and the why's and the best possible outcomes, you can also strategize a little bit. You can manage expectations, which is a huge deal. That is how you build those trusting relationships is by managing those expectations. And you were just talking about risk and with Mm -hmm. risk comes the possibility that there are outcomes that you don't like. Well, let's get those all out on the table. If we're going to do it this way, you need to know that this might happen. These are the possible scenarios that we, we might run into. And clients' priorities shift over time. That's a good point too, because there might be in-house counsel that changes, teams that change, business folks that change. The industry can change. The industry can change, you're right. And so it's good to have these types of regular communications because then you, at least for me, I feel more in touch with the client and I'm able to give more precise advice. So on the flip side of that, you know, we've got clients who are very aware of the billable hour or very conscious about limiting their interaction with their attorney. And we've given you some advice on how to establish that relationship and feel like you're getting a good rapport with your outside counsel. But then I have clients who are quite the opposite and who, you know, would bring you in very early on in a process where there's lots of cooks in the kitchen and there's been no initial conversation about a topic or they are a client who just free form will talk with you for two hours about a topic from one to another. And let me be candid. I don't mind those conversations. I actually enjoy them. And again, I feel like when I'm brought in early on a a brainstorming project, or if I'm brought in, you know, at the outset of a question or an issue that comes up and they, I'm the first person they think of, and they want to ask me these questions and talk to me for two hours, I'm perfectly fine. But I don't then want them to feel like they've gotten sticker shock when they get the invoice and they say that I've billed them for the two hour, you know, girl fest Mm -hmm. (laughs) or the, you know, two hour brainstorming session. So if you're in a situation where, again, there's that push and pull between getting advice from outside counsel, but needing to be very conservative on your fees, 
I suggest be mindful of when you bring in your outside counsel. You know, you have this good rapport, you know, they give good advice, but if they're brought in early on, let's just say you've discovered an issue. It's a dispute. You are going to file litigation likely, but we don't know exactly all the claims. We don't know anything too precise, right? The business folks all want to get together and discuss what do you know, what they all know, and to compare notes. And they ask you to be a part of that call. Again, happy to be a part of the call, happy to issue spot, but just know that that call is likely to go on for a very long time. And perhaps outside counsel's input might not be substantive or targeted or as beneficial than say, having that brain session first, isolating the issue, and then having a second conversation with the correct people in the room to then ask the very targeted questions to your outside counsel. And I know I'm sort of being, I'm flip-flopping because I say, yes, establish a rapport and give them all this information about the industry and your your, your company, but also <laughs> be careful of how uh, how early you bring them in. But it is, it's that trying to find that happy medium. And I think just being mindful of when you bring in outside counsel is critical. There's a sweet spot. For there sure. is a sweet spot. In, in, in the scenario you just put forth where, where there's potential litigation bringing us in too early, we're going to start deposing all of you. Like you, <laughs> We're going to want to know everything about everybody that's on the call that has knowledge about what's going on. This is high risk stuff if we're about to sue somebody. So bringing us in too early for something like that, probably a bad idea, but there is a sweet spot. I would say that too early is often better than too late though. That's a good point. Um, here's, here's a separate example. We both do IP work and trademarks. Every business has them, whether or not they know it or not. And say they have this new product they're excited about. I've seen this scenario time and time again, that they will start falling in love with a name for it. And if you're going to start making decisions about when to bring in your outside counsel, I would say that the sweet spot is once you figured out what you want to do, but before you've started making affirmative steps to make it happen. If you've decided on a name that you love, before you start going buying in domains, before you start getting graphic designers involved with designing logos and then printing that on labels and slapping it on a product at that point you've gone too far because the step you missed if you would have brought us in earlier is that it's it's smart to do a trademark knockout search you need to know what the potential risks are of using that name and just because you don't know anybody that's using it doesn't mean those risks aren't there and there have been so many times when a company will fall in love with a name and they'll start moving forward. And hopefully sooner than later, you get a, a cease and desist letter because the, the later, the worse it's going to be for you. They often don't like to hear this at the time that we're brought in. And we maybe we do do that knockout search showing you, hey, there are some significant risks for you here that can get very, very expensive if you ignore this and you love this name so much that you're just going to keep on going and ignoring that risk because they don't want to acknowledge it. They love it so much. And it also sounds expensive to just acknowledge that, did we just waste those last couple of days, weeks or months doing this? Maybe, but sometimes it's a smarter decision to just eat that and acknowledge it. And for the most part, after going through it once, you're not going to repeat that. You're going to know going forward, okay, these knockout searches, those are a thing. I need to start timing when these are done because otherwise I'm going to waste all this time or I'm going to ignore them and I'm going to do it and then I'm going to get sued and not just going to have to pay for the rebrand, which is going to happen anyway. If you're found liable, you're also going to pay us. You hate doing that. You're going to have to pay them for all the damages. So finding that sweet spot, like you said, very important, not just for trademarks like in this example or litigation. It's something that can be applied to most fields of law. So the counter to that, and I agree, it has to be a sweet spot, right? One to bring outside counsel in on a project. So the opposite, on the other side of that 
argument is sometimes I'm brought in before a name is selected, which is absolutely fine, but perhaps they have 50 names <laughs> <laughs> and they want you to do searches of 50 names. And again, happy, happy to run to 50 knockout searches for you. And frankly, I have done it <laughs> for a client. And I'm again, completely upfront with the cost and all of that good stuff. So some clients, they need that. They need to have the 50 options vetted before they present to their counterparts, but not everyone, right? So if I'm brought in early, which I'm happy to be a part of that process, but if you don't know yet kind of the direction or the theme or the basics, it might be a little bit too early. If you are at the stage perhaps where you've got five marks, that you're thinking about, that might be a good time for me to come in. Because then I could say of those five marks, three appear just inherently unregisterable because they're generic or descriptive. Or I can say these look better than, than those. Do you want me to prioritize, do two at a time? Do you want me to do all five? You know, that's a, that's a good point in which, you know, to bring in your outside counsel. And frankly, if you don't know when, you could, again, going back to what we said before, call them up and say, hey, this is what we're thinking about doing. Can I have a two-minute off-the-clock call with you? Because I need to figure out at what point should I you know, engage you for this project. So this leads me to the last topic. And again, I think going back to what you were saying before, it's a question that maybe clients don't even know to ask, which is, does the firm or attorney offer any complimentary value-added services? So what do I mean by that? So when we were talking earlier about searches, say there are 50 and I don't, they don't know how to cull it down to five. How do you do that? You know, they're not a trademark attorney. They don't know how to do searches on the USPTO. How do I bring it down to a more reasonable number? What we do at Dickinson Wright and what Kevin and I do is we offer in-house seminars for free to help train their paralegal or their staff member on how to run searches. I've done multiple training sessions for the same client because perhaps they have a new paralegal that's never done IP before. I'll train them on how to do basic searches and then they'll start to get more familiar. Okay, then let's do a little bit a deeper dive. And then they get to a point where they can do in, uh, knockout searches in-house. And I know that there are attorneys out there saying, why are you, <laughs> why are you giving up the work, right? Why are you training the client to make it so that they don't need you? And so this is really where it's sort of interesting, right? It's, it's where folks who are in-house before and those who've only practiced in private firms, that's where the paths diverge. <laughs> that's where I think there's a difference between say how Kevin and I practice and others, because for me, it's not about always getting every single drop of blood from a client, every single dollar an hour, because again, going back to being human, <laughs> it's, it's just the right thing to do, right? If there's a task that I think that they can easily do in-house, and I recognize that they may have a staff member that can do it in-house, let's train them. I want the client to shine in front of their supervisors. I want them to be able to learn a new task or a skill set. Good on them. I want them to grow and develop as a professional. And as I hope they feel about me too. I love training my clients with tasks that I think they can do in-house. So we do in-house seminars on doing searches. Sometimes a client will want to know how to do their own applications, which is a little tricky sometimes, but there are some tasks that they can do in-house. Or perhaps there is software that is expensive, like a docketing software, for instance. We use a fairly sophisticated, very expensive docketing software where we input trademark data and it creates lists of deadlines, for instance. In-house counsel, they might not have the budget to have that software accessible to them. Ask outside counsel, hey, can we have your docketing clerk docket these in your system and then shoot me an email when they come up or send me just a quarterly report or a monthly report? I'm always going to say yes, because <laughs> that's that's a service that, one, I'm not spending any time doing. It's docketing clerk who is not a billable person. 
she's going to docket it anyway and then sends you a report. It helps you. It keeps you on track. Hopefully it's something where it'll develop more work for us. Right. And it almost, I mean, I, I think every single time we've done it, it's generated more work for us. But if there's anything like that, where the firm has a service, a tool that you want access to, the answer might be no, but might be yes too. So you should ask. And I think that's a question that sometimes clients don't know to ask. And another one is, for instance, we do a high volume of work. We watch a lot of marks. We use a vendor for it. We get a significant discount off the vendor because we have such, we have hundreds and hundreds, thousands of marks that we watch and we have the highest percentage of discount. Well, if you're in-house, you might not have that many marks that you need to watch, but If you use our subscription, then you can get that benefit of the discount. And so we'll set it up so the emails go to you, not us, but you still get the benefit of the discount from the vendor. So these are just, you know, I'm rambling now, but these are just (laughs) examples of some of the things that we've, you know, responded to or or provided to a client. I just need to, some clients, I don't know if they benefit from it or want it, but these are things you should be mindful of when you're um, working with outside counsel. Well, they got to be aware of it to know if they want it, right? These are the kinds of freebies and discounts that they might not even be aware of. So that's a good point. Asking the question. Yeah. So not just asking the question, but this goes back to what we were saying before. Get to know your attorney. Mm -hmm. Take them to lunch. Ask them, what is, how does your day go? How, what, what do you do? And what kind of, you know, what does your practice look like? And who's on your team? And how are they servicing your clients? And you get to know better what their practice is like. And know like, oh, I didn't know that there's a watch subscription and I didn't know that there was a discount you get. And when you establish that rapport, that's where all this kind of information comes up. And if the attorney is one you have a good rapport with, they'll hopefully offer to give you these services. I know that I'm happy to provide them because, again, it's more about a long-term relationship than getting every drop day one. That conversation that we were talking about before goes both ways. It's not just valuable to you for us to know what's going on with your company. It's valuable to you for you to know how our operation works and how it can help you even more. And these are the kinds of tools that a lot of them just aren't even aware of that exist. What we decide about how we're willing to share those things, for instance, the training that you mentioned before, You touched on how there may be other people in this industry that would be reluctant to do that. Well, we've talked a few times today about how we're not all vampires. (laughs) And we in particular, you and I, are interested in a long-term relationship because that's how we thrive and survive in this industry. And building that kind of trust with your clients so that they understand that you're not this vampire that's just trying to get every dollar for every minute that you're talking to them or helping them with their business, with their legal needs, it goes a long way. In the time that I've been practicing, I've already seen that most of the clients that come to me are coming from word of mouth. Hmm. Doing these things for your clients so that they recognize that you're a partner, someone that's not trying to bleed them dry, that's not gonna be part of the cause of their business going under because they spent too much money with you, they'll recognize that. They'll pay it forward for you by giving you a boost, by recommending you to the people that they know that need your services, that they do business with. And that's how this can be mutually beneficial. Well, with that, I mean, I think we've hit a lot of great topics. I think the general theme of the conversation really is about establishing a good relationship with your outside counsel. We've given some tools on how to create that relationship and build upon that relationship without being charged. But I just want to, you know, leave with a concept that I am sort of repeating myself here, but, you know, just recognizing that we're all humans, right? We all have our own pressures and our own expectations that we need to, to meet and giving each other some grace, some courtesy, both from a client as well as outside counsel is just huge. And I think people fail to realize that we're humans who have their own lives. And the more I'm able to establish a more personal relationship with a client, the better. It's not, we're not here to, like Kevin said, be vampires. (laughs) Um, We're really here for me anyway. And I know for Kevin as well, 
It's really to find a good sort of give and take, a good relationship. I want to come in every day and look forward to working on your files. When you call and I see your name on caller ID, I get excited. I pick up and say hello and how are your kids? And these are all you know great things. And I hope that when my name comes up on caller ID, that the client feels the same, right? But how to get there is sometimes, you know, sometimes it's hard, right? We don't know. And hopefully we've given you some tips on how to create a, a good relationship with your outside counsel. We hope that you enjoyed this episode of DW Fast Track. Be on the lookout for our next episode of All Things Legal, Admissible, and Trending, or visit our website at www.dickinsonwright.com. <laughs>